Okay, now, the former president, Jerry John Rawlings, has died. And, of course, we've seen so many reactions from the business community when it comes to his legacies on the economic front. Now, this whole particular contribution to Ghana's economy in the beginning of the Fourth Republic has seen so many people within the space of economic uh, you know, landscape joining in via Zoom to help us understand the impact of his death, his contributions to the economy, as former uh, finance minister said, Tekwe, who's worked closely with the former president on matters concerning the economy. Of course, I believe he joins us right now. Many thanks for joining us. Sir. First of all, will it be fair for us to say that the policies introduced by the former president have indeed helped to shape the economic architecture of Ghana? <clears throat> Good afternoon to your viewers. Yes, without doubt, the policies, you know, have shaped, you know, the present day uh, economic management. Um, and the reason I say that is that one would have to go beyond 1983 in the past to see a situation where Ghana's economy went up and down almost every year you know, between growth and recession. I think the launch of the structural adjustment program uh, during between 1983 and 1985, to be precise, that brought about the stability in fiscal and monetary management, uh, as well as real sector strategies that we see today. One useful indicator, the most headline of all, which is growth is that I have repeated that since 1983, when we achieved a very high growth as a result of the structural adjustment program or economic recovery program, Ghana for nearly 40 years has not experienced negative growth. Even when other major African economies <clears throat> are facing recession, one example being between 2014 and 2015, you know, when crude oil prices fell, and as a result of our domestic pressures, like Dumso and others, uh, in addition to the global financial crisis a decade, Ghana did not go into recession at the time Nigeria, Angola, South Africa, and others went into recession. And that is because of the inherent adjustments that come with the structural adjustment program you know, which is a legacy of the Rollins era. Mm. Speaking of the legacy, do you also think that the current development vindicates the, the introduction of the value-added tax by the former president, Jerry Rollins, amidst various condemnation? Well, you spoke about my working with the, um, with the, I believe you were referring to um, President Rollins. I must say that, yes, I was part of, the work done, but from a distance mm. initially, early, and until the VAT, I hadn't come, you know, that close. Even though I had the privilege of having worked under Mr. Tua Hoy at the Structural Adjustment Program and National Revenue Secretariat, which gave birth to GRE, uh, to work quite closely. And you mentioned, you know, VAT, which was uh, among many, many reforms that were implemented, the one that was the most challenging, I believe, for the administration, uh, because VAT should have come earlier mm. uh, uh, during the other reforms when we had autonomy for the revenue agencies and created IRS SEPs. When we rationalized the objectives of all the taxes, we did some expenditure management, real sector management like the energy sector. If we have time, we can talk about some of these. Unfortunately, it was uh, the VAT. But yes, I think it's, um, you can say President Rollins and the team that brought about the VAT have indicated today because the VAT has become the most stable, you know, of our revenue sources. And that is because the VAT is predominantly dedicated to generating revenue uh, compared to say tariffs, which have a protective function as well as revenue and um, excises, which, you know, are punitive and therefore are often called sin taxes. Mm. So, yeah, I think that uh, the Rollins era and regime has been dedicated on the point of, um, of VAT. And it's interesting that 
uh, VAT uh, was launched and relaunched in 1999. So this is the 20th anniversary, you know, of you know the launch, the relaunch of the VAT after the cancellation and relaunch in 1999. So that itself uh, is testimony to the vision that the man had as a leader. Uh, he entrusted people with work and he allowed them to implement. And this is one of the things which I believe anybody who has served under, you know, President Rollins. The economic team, some of the names I worked under, you know, of obviously Dr. Butchery, uh, his deputies, uh, Mr. Late, Mr. Misata, the late uh, <clears throat> Salome, um, Moses Asaga briefly, uh, Honorable Moses Asaga, uh, and, and many, many, you know, others, Mr. Tuahoy, as I mentioned. Uh, of course, you can't omit names like Joe Abbey. And when you start doing this... Interesting. Uh, M M Mr. Tekwe, also, you know, I'm very curious to find this uh, particular, you know, argument out. <laughs> Talking about the ideology of uh, President Rawlings, the, the late, uh, you know, President Rawlings's economic reforms. Many of us still, you know, young people out there, interested to know: was it much more of a socialist ideology or somewhat of a capitalist one? Looking at the ideologies, of course, of the National Democratic Congress. Of course, at the founder of the party, um, the ideology of the party is social democracy. Uh, and therefore, I think that, you know, I would say that that is ideology um, for the party that is founded and that is what, you know, but the points you are probably alluding to is pragmatism in managing the economy. I think that um, the Rollins era, and that is what makes it, you know, brings up the question of whether, you know, it was a capitalist economy, a socialist or communist, as some have said. Mm. Uh, I would say it is. Uh, social democracy, but with a real sense of pragmatism about what works. Because the, the in economic policy, you face many challenges. And I think that countries like uh, China, which are deemed communist, but have significant market economy you know, issues. A uh, few people know that uh, China Exim and CDB actually make most of their money, not from the Chinese government, but from exactly. ratings you know, economies, uh, they compete with the Western economies. So I would say that for Rollins and the team that we led, they were pragmatic enough to go to the fund, they were pragmatic because uh, like 2015, if you are faced with a situation where budget support is, with, is being withdrawn and your only option is to go to the IMF and the World Bank, you know, that's what you have to do. Whilst your own policies such as the stabilization fund and others come in, which I would say are second generation policies that came with the rationalization, particularly of the fiscal regime under the Rawlings administration. Looking into the crystal ball, finally, where do you, you know, um, argue out Ghana's economic direction, considering all that you've told us regarding the visionary legacy of the former, you know, uh, president who has, you know, passed away, unfortunately. Where do you see or how do you pr project Ghana's economic standing in the future under the wings of, you know, former President Rawlings's, you know, economic legacy? Well, if Rawlings had, for example, oil had done rebasing uh, and uh, the growth of the uh, services sector which started in the 90s and, um, and actually shot up with uh, the under President Kufo, I believe that the economy would have been, you know, more stable than what we see today. Um, because why do I say this? Ghana has become a middle-income country. Ghana has gone through a transition where the services sector is the largest sector of the economy, where the, uh, uh, you have banking, you have transportation, and whatever, which we must respond to. But unfortunately, under the current situation where COVID notwithstanding, we have you know, deficit facing us of 15%, where COVID is just 3% of this, uh, and you have debt of about 80%. No, that, this is the sort of trajectory which was corrected in the 1990s. And incidentally, is a trajectory that we need to correct. And uh, it is important that, you know, we, we, we get a bit, you know, concerned about uh, these numbers that, that have been thrown about and about the change in some of the policies, in some of the measures, you know, such as how do you calculate the deficits? 
the framework since the uh, and this are under legacy of the Rawlings administration. Sure. The framework in the thesis have been defined over a period of nearly 40 years. Why change it now? The framework for determining what is there has been defined for nearly 40 years. Why change it now? So I would call for stability. You know, in a way we do uh, not just complications that manage the economy, in order that the economy can return to a path. You know, and this is this is this is a mixture of not just private sector policy, but having a good of you know social intervention. There is one way, you know, which actually defines you know social intervention, which is also a you know Rawlings legacy, and that way is pump scatch, you know, mm. uh, some of adjustments, you know, to mitigate the program. Yes, our adjustment to mitigate the you know effects of a structural adjustment. Sure. Scratch for that matter. Sure. This Sekwe. was at a time when everybody thought everything that was being done was liberalization and others it was launched to respond, you know, to the and so you have a mix of economic policy. Uh, and I believe today, uh, if you want to justify social democracy, if you want to justify social intervention, we are debating which of the two governments you know, uh, uh, past and present, you know, is heavy on social intervention. Would you ask whether the MPP has become communist or socialist for that matter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll leave that to the economists to decide. But we're so grateful <laughs> that you joined us, you know, with that particular explanation there, Set Tech with the former finance minister, sharing with us the economic uh, reforms, the legacy of the former uh, late president, Jerry Rawlings, there.